الله أكبر الله أكبر Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My name is Sophia, I'm your host. The aim of Let the Quran Speak is to help you gain deeper insights into Muslims and Islam, as it is practiced here and in other parts of the world. In this episode, a homeless panhandler of Kansas City recently returned an engagement ring to a woman who had accidentally dropped it into his cup. The story was reported in newspapers across North America. Honesty seems to be a rare quality these days. How do we cultivate honesty amongst our family and friends and in our larger societal circles? We'll be discussing this topic a little later in the show. But first, a newly invented nail polish has become hugely popular amongst Muslim women. It's called Inglot O2M Breathable Nail Enamel. Muslim women who believe water must touch the surface of the nail in a pre-prayer washing ritual say they no longer need to consider nail polish off limits. The question is, if neither the Quran nor Hadith men mention nail polish, how did it come to be considered prohibited in this sense? Are Muslims obsessing over details that aren't really important? With me to discuss nitpicking about Islamic law, Dr. Shabir Ali, President of the Islamic Informa Information Center. Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Pleasure to be on. So I don't know if you've heard about this nail polish. The inventor has actually passed away, um, but Muslim women are flocking to it um, in Quebec City, in, in Quebec actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've, I've heard of this uh, nail polish and uh, the, the news of this has got me thinking about uh, the origin of this law, who, who, who made this a law and uh, the broader implications... A law that nail polish shouldn't be used. In, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the broader implications of, of this law. Uh, often uh, scholars for very good reasons have arrived at certain interpretations and, and details uh, of law with, without um, n seeing our present context. Um, and, and thinking about the effects of, of this. Uh, let me mention some, some possibilities here. Uh, suppose so a non-Muslim... First state what the issue is. That the issue is the there's a nail polish and, and that one, you know, for ablution, one should, you know, have all, every aspect of one's body or particular body parts washed. This is obviously yes. the basic thinking behind it. Uh, the Quran says uh, wash, when, you, when you get up for prayer, you should wash your uh, faces and your hands uh, up to the elbows mm -hmm. and uh, wipe your head and the feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, two different inter interpretations uh, arise from this, whether you are required to wash the feet or, or just simply to wipe the feet. And uh, the solution for this in, in most Sunni uh, interpretations is that you, you wash the feet generally, but if you had socks on uh, at the time, if, if you were in a state of ablution, the, the uh, washing before prayer, um, at the time of putting on the socks when you last put it on, then when it comes to the next time that you need to renew your washing, uh, you don't need to wash the feet, but just simply wipe over it. Mm -hmm. And a wipe over it means passing a moist uh, hand over the sock in a symbolic way to uh, substitute for the, for the washing. Mm -hmm. So the issue with nail polish is that it, you know, it's impermeable and the fear is that water wouldn't uh, touch the nail bed. Yes, that's of course when one takes the, the Im instructions in the most literal mm -hmm. manner possible mm -hmm. and, uh, and they say, well, okay, when it says wash, it means wash exactly right down to the skin. Mm -hmm. And if you have some, some barrier preventing the water from reaching the skin, uh, such as nail polish, well, then your washing is not valid. And so you must remove that barrier first and then wash completely and then you're fine. Mm -hmm. So uh, theoretically then, if, uh, if had it not been for the difficulty of removing and reapplying nail polish uh, um, every time one needs to renew the ablutions, then there's nothing wrong with the nail polish itself. Mm -hmm. the, the, the only thing that one would see wrong with it is that it then prevents uh, the water from reaching the, the nail at the time uh, when one is washing for prayer. Mm -hmm. So what's the issue here? Why, why is this a concern to you? Well, it's a concern to me because when, when you think about the implications, uh, if you have, for example, a, a non-Muslim woman hearing about this great news for Muslim women, now they can use this nail polish, uh, well, first of all, there is the question of the uh, readily uh, uh, the, the availability of this nail polish to begin with uh, now. 
um, the cost of it, um, the, how well it has been tested, uh, and to know whether it is um, safe to use and so on. There are all these concerns. But before this uh, nail polish became available, I want to think back to the time when um, it was not and what it would have meant for people to hear that there is this rule that you can't, basically you can't, practically you can't, you can't use nail polish because it's going to interfere with your prayers. Mm -hmm. So there will be non-Muslim women who hear of this and think, oh, uh, nail polish, oh, I'm accustomed to nail polish, I guess I can't be a Muslim. Hmm. Uh, now you might have uh, a Muslim woman. Or more like this is such a small issue, why do, why do you even have to worry about it? It could be that. Yeah. Uh, you see, if somebody was not even contemplating being a Muslim, one would say, oh, this is like nitpicking. Why do you guys, why, why, why do you have a religion with so many laws? Mm -hmm. Down to my fingernails too. Mm -hmm. uh, but if somebody was contemplating being a Muslim, be a Muslim, not be a Muslim, and then hear about this and they think, well, oh, that too, I guess, you know, that'll be difficult for me. I, I don't think I can be a Muslim. Then you might have Muslim women who uh, have been praying and, and they never thought of this as a rule. Because when, when you say wash, people take it in a general way. Let's say you have nail polish on and you weren't thinking about washing before prayers and somebody said, wash your hands. So you went, you washed your hands. You came back. You have the nail polish on. Did you wash your hands? Yes, of course I did. Oh, but you have nail polish. Nobody says, but oh, you had nail polish, so you didn't really wash your hands thoroughly. Hmm. Uh, th because the point is that you went, you washed your hands in a reasonable way. So uh, for many Muslim women who didn't hear of this fatwa or rule that you, nail polish interferes with the washing, they might have carried on their lives and for many years they might have prayed, uh, washing in a reasonable way, thinking that their prayer is valid. And now what they're hearing is that the washing wasn't valid and the prayer too by implication wasn't valid. Mm. And, and so they might be thinking, well, now I have a choice. I either have to uh, remove the nail polish from my future prayers, or if I want to keep my nail polish on, maybe I shouldn't be praying then because the prayer isn't valid. Mm. And then you can have Muslim women who generally are not praying, uh, but for whatever reason, not that they should not pray, but they grew up in cultures where people did not uh, take prayer seriously, and so they know themselves to be Muslims, but they haven't been praying. And maybe it's in the back of their minds that eventually I'll pray. But uh, now if you tell them this rule about the nail polish and they're accustomed to using nail polish, now they have a further reason to delay ever beginning to pray. So these are some of the implications now uh, mm -hmm. of, of just a simple thing like that. So how did the rule come about? Because ablution, um, it, it's mentioned in the Quran and Hadith, but of course nail polish is not mentioned. Um, but there are certain circumstances in which, for example, one doesn't, let's say, even need to use water to, to perform ablution. Yes, so the, the rule came about for two basic reasons. One it is uh, the, the, the attitude of Muslim scholars to take uh, things in the most literal manner possible. And, and two, the failure to see the broad picture. So the most literal manner possible is like, you know, if, if I said that somebody's touched my shoulder, uh, I don't mean they physically touched my, the skin of my shoulder. I, they might have touched over my garment, right? Um, uh, but, but if somebody says l the most literally po possible, you should say they touched the coat that I was wearing over my shoulder. Hmm. We, we don't speak like that. Uh, but, but Muslim scholars tended to take the statements of the Quran and, and of the authentic sayings of our Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in the most literal sense possible. And, and when they do it in that sense, they, they arrive at nonsense actually. Uh, the, the second thing is that is a failure to see the big picture and you just hinted at one of the aspects that uh, the, there are circumstances when it, water is not available. Uh, or it, water may be available, but that water may be reserved for a special purpose, such as for drinking, mm -hmm. and so should not be used for ablutions if it's essential for drinking. Uh, or there they might be some physical danger or, or illness that could result from using the available water, let's mm -hmm. say the water is too cold on a wintry day, uh, then uh, one has the permission to use, uh, to, to use a substitute, and the substitute is mentioned in the Quran as well. This is referred to as dry ablution or tayammum. Uh, basically the Quran says that you should touch a clean surface and then wipe uh, with your hands, basically your dry hands, uh, your face and your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this does not involve any washing, but what, what does it accomplish? It accomplishes the same sort of um, preparedness, and it's a mental preparedness that the Muslim should approach the prayer with. That, that's a preparedness that comes from some 
act that the Muslim has done here to get one's mind in, in, in a state of readiness to speak to God. It, it breaks the continuity between the, the mundane things and now the sacred communication or communion with, with God. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that this is the purpose of the, uh, of the ablution might be seen when we step back and look more broadly at, at what are the things that break the ablution. So the, the things that break the ablution are generally related to the private parts. And of course, the private parts would be washed in some of these circumstances as uh, is uh, uh, required. But that washing is not part of the ablution itself. Hmm. Uh, the, the, uh, and, and the ablution itself does not involve those parts. It involves the, the outer limbs of the body, which may or may not be cleaned fr fr from other uh, external uh, contamination. So if, if one's body is not dusty, still one goes through the same ritual washing, because the purpose is not to cleanse the physical body, the purpose is to cleanse the spirit. A and that's what this symbolic washing is supposed to do. Once we, realize, uh, once we understand the symbolic nature of this washing, we, we come to see how nitpicky it is to, to say that if the water doesn't uh, penetrate the, the nail polish, then a woman's uh, washing would not be valid. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't want to just be concerned with the spirit of the law. Um, w we also need to be concerned with the letter of the law as well. Yes, of course the, the letter of the law... We don't want to you yes. know, escape entirely from the letter of the law. True, law true, and we shouldn't approach this in a wanton manner. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we should not uh, generate more rules than are necessary, and we should see, again see the broad picture. Uh, it is noted in, in Hadith that the Prophet, peace be upon him, recommended for women to, to paint their hands, and the paint that was available at the time was henna. Now, one might say, oh, but uh, the henna is permeable. Hmm. But, but there was no discussion over this as to, you know, this is the reason for the henna being permissible and other substances are not permissible. There, there was no such discussion. That's a, that's a much later thing that scholars have come to think about and said, oh, the henna is permissible because that's permeable. Other substances, not, not permissible. Uh, moreover, it is noted in the hadith that the Prophet, peace be upon him, recommended for women to, to paint the nails, actually. And mm -hmm. again, the, the paint that was available to them was henna. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him himself, is noted to have used uh, kohal, which is uh, a kind of an eye paint. Uh, it uh, may have some, uh, or thought to have some beneficial uh, medical effects uh, in, when it's used in the eye. Uh, but it does paint uh, the, the eye a little bit, at least the, the, uh, out the, the rims of, of the lids. Uh, but nobody has ever said, well, you have to wash off that kohal uh, thoroughly before you can even think that your wudu is going to be, or your ablution is going to be valid. Moreover, the Prophet, peace be upon him, used and recommended the use of perfume. Mm -hmm. and, and, and perfumes at the time were mostly oil-based. And, and if you, you know that oil and water doesn't mix, so if you have a coating of oil on your skin, then the water probably will not penetrate as well uh, and, and as easily as if you had not had that. And nobody has ever said that you have to wash off that perfume first before you can make your ablution thoroughly. Uh, and we can go on and on, but mm -hmm. there is so much more in that broader picture that is just missed when people just simply give a, a simplistic rule and say, no, you can't do that. Uh, you can't use the nail polish without seeing the broader implications of what that rule will do and seeing the bigger picture of how did you get to this rule to begin with. The rule does not fit with that bigger picture. All right, very interesting perspective. Thank you for that, Brother Shibir. You're welcome. We'll take a break. When we return, we will discuss honesty.